is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off, Skip. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical, it's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. Genuine, accountable, and raw. Here is Steve Gruber. It's Tuesday, and welcome to it, my friends. It's Tuesday here on the Steve Gruber Show. I appreciate your support this morning. The phone number to get involved and share your common sense thoughts, 888-999-66. This part of the program brought to you by Consumers Mutual Insurance. Consumers Mutual is the insurance company I selected for myself and my family after you know looking at all the confusing issues out there. I select the Consumers Mutual. They're different. They're a co-op, which means I have a stake in what goes on. You can find out more at consumersmutual.org. 150 of the Hillary Clinton emails now contain classified information as that investigation continues. Donald Trump is pledging to reverse President Barack Obama's renaming of Mount McKinley to its Athabascan name of Denali. And on the main stage, who's it going to be? Is it going to be... Carly Fiorina or Chris Christie? That's the battle that's going on right now because of the way the CNN has done their rules for the next Republican debate. Of course, the Democrats won't get together on the main stage until sometime in October. Chris Christie and Carly Fiorina battling for that main stage spot, the last spot, the 10th spot. Christie's supporters are spending a million dollars in advertising to solidify his position. Fiorina is unlikely to be able to buy the ad time needed to help her climb enough in the national polls to make it out of the main stage in just two weeks, according to most insiders. With 10 days to go until CNN decides the top 10 for the next Republican debate, Fiorina's campaign sent out a fundraising email to supporters yesterday asking for donations to help the candidate make it to the prime time stage. CNN has made it crystal clear that they'll do anything, even use funny math and nonsensical arguments to keep a critical outsider voice, the voice of Carly Fiorina off that stage, said the letter. Time to donate now. Fiorina's uh, low numbers early before the August 6th debate kept her off that stage then, but her performance there propelled her into the top five in many polls since. Here's the deal. Carly should be on the stage. Her numbers warranted. You know, the CNN math goes back to July 15th. They're basing who's on the stage in September on polls done in July. Well, you know, back then, Jeb Bush and Scott Walker were right in the top two or three. That has all changed since. Donald Trump has pulled away from the pack then, uh, since then. Uh, you know, it's it's not the same... It's not the same group, but even if Fiona's campaign or Super PAC were willing to spend millions of dollars on advertising between now and September the 10th, CNN's poll cutoff date, it would be hard for her to garner enough national polling points to get to the top 10. And that's uh, according to Stuart Stevens, the chief strategist for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential run. If you're looking at national numbers, it's very hard to buy that. People say, well, buy Fox, but Fox is 2 million people, and that's not nearly enough to move national polls, said Stevens. It's unclear how much money either the Fiorina campaign or the Pro Fiorina Super PAC has spent or plans to spend on paid advertising to help her get into the primary debate stage. But, you know, her voice is worth hearing. So here's what's going to happen. If she doesn't make it to the main stage, if she doesn't make it to the main stage, Sarah Isker Flores, her campaign manager, told us on this program just a couple of days ago, that she will come on our program on that day, and we'll give her all the time she wants. She wants half an hour, she can have it. She wants an hour, she can have it. She will lay out her plans and her ideas. Remember, Michigan's very important this year. March 8th is the Michigan primary for the Republicans this year. It's you know, And it's critical. Michigan, we're actually in the mix, which is important because that means we get to see all the candidates. You see, and that's I think that that's extremely important that we get to see all the candidates and 
evaluate the cans, and, and they're all going to come here. You know, in years past, we didn't get this kind of attention because our because our you know our, our primary was too late. Frankly, well, good for Michigan. There was a lot of a lot of angry uh, Republicans on the national stage, and so what? It's good for us because we can see. All of the candidates pass through Michigan. And, of course, coming up on Mackinac Island, a big Republican get-together in just a couple of weeks. What is that? The 16th, 17th in there. Uh, the Mackinac Island, the Republicans are beginning together. Ivy and I will be up there, so will Rob Burkhardt, our, our assistant uh, producer. We're going to talk to as many of these Republican candidates as we can possibly find, and we're going to share that with you throughout the balance of the campaign. Let's shift gears for just a moment. Go to that hotline. LJ is on the hotline this morning. Welcome to it, LJ. Thank you. I've got a little question that's been kind of canoodling around in my brain, and that in itself is kind of disturbing, but I think this question is even a little more disturbing, is why are we letting the Communist News Network tell us who we should and should not be listening to in a debate? And in fact, well, look, it's their debate in us effect. to what they want us to hear. Well, there's, there's truth in what you say, LJ, but the fact of the matter is that at the end of the day, it's still their network. And at the end of the day, we still have to, you know, work within their parameters. And if they set the same as Fox said it, you know, the top ten make it to the main stage, the other ones go to the kids' table. Yeah. And that's the way like, it worked out. Yeah, it's like this, this doesn't seem like a real good idea, you know, to be uh, saying to CNN, okay, well, you're the one that's got the... Uh, megaphone, maybe we should just kind of uh, uh, bow down to you and let you tell us what we can and can't hear and who we hear from. And I just, I think that's really kind of uh, problematic, don't you? Well, LJ, I don't disagree with you, and I appreciate your call in. I mean, I understand where you're coming from that you don't want one network or another network to dictate the parameters, but. It is their news department, and therefore they have some input on how this is done. And it's done with agreement, by the way, with the Republican National Committee. So they, they work together to arrive at the debate rules. It just seems kind of ridiculous that they're going all the way back to mid-July to come up with with um, the parameters, with the polling to determine who makes the stage. And so um, well, we'll, here's what we'll do. Here's what I want to do, LJ, and I'm going to step up and take one for the team. Ivy, I think, is going to be on board with this. Well, we will hold a roundtable debate right here on the Steve Gruber Show with every Republican candidate that wants to show up. I guarantee it. Now, it might just be her and I debating, but you know, it might be just her, I, and Carly debating. But we'll bring every one of them that wants to talk about it because I agree. And remember, the Democrats have been threatened outright for holding any debates or discussions that appear to be a debate outside the parameters of their official rules, too. You know, so it's not just the Republicans. It's not just uh, CNN. The Democrats are worse about it. The Democrats say they're only going to have six debates total, and they're going to leave it right at that. Something real quick? Yeah, you know, there's one way you could uh, just don't watch the debates. Just complete. you know, then if there are no, uh, if there's no viewers, then they'll be forced to do what you want. They're going to be viewers. Donald Trump's there. There will be viewers. I can guarantee you that. We'll be back in a moment on the Steve Gruber Show. Covering Michigan and the world from his bunker below the bridge. Here is Steve Gruber. Generals gathered in their masses. Just like witches at black masses. Evil minds that plot destruction. Sorcerer of death. All right, welcome back to It's Tuesday. It's the Steve Gruber Show. Greatly appreciate your support. Brought to you in part by Mesa. Good health, good business, and great schools. Let's see. The hotline is hot open today at 888-999-66. Glenn heard the call. He decided to stop in and check in. Glenn, welcome to the program. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. Hey, uh, How are you? All days call me to maybe kind of wonder if... Um, there will be a Democratic debate on Fox or not. 
No, there will not. Not not that I'm aware of. I don't believe so. Um, they would not, again. It's all set up by Debbie Wasserman Schultz in large part. And let's make no mistake, Debbie Wasserman Schultz right now is running pre-damage control, if you will. She's the one insulating Hillary from any more than six debates. She's the one that's making sure that Martin O'Malley and, and Bernie Sanders and, and Joe Biden, whoever ends up on the in the in the conversation, uh, she's the one controlling who ends up on the stage. Uh, so on Fox, no chance. <laughs> so we're the only ones dumb enough to go into the enemy camp and debate. Is basically what it's uh, what it comes down to. Well, make no mistake, make no mistake, Glenn, and, and you know this, but I'll, I'll I'll underscore it for you. Uh, there are different standards for Republicans and Democrats. There are different levels of of, of what you must, uh, how you must conduct yourself. Republicans have always been held to a higher standard by Republicans and by Democrats. And think about the scandals that you're familiar with in, in different parts of government. Republicans have always been held to a different standard by themselves and by the opponents. And it's no different here. So yes, we uh, the Republicans will go into. CNN is, you call it, enemy territory to conduct a debate, but the Republicans are never afraid, uh, conservatives are never afraid to say, here's where I stand and here's why, and, and to outline their, their position. That's a, that's a really good point. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. I, I greatly appreciate you checking in, Glenn, because, you know, when, when you speak the truth and you talk common sense, well, uh, you, get, you, you get held to a, to a tougher standard, and that's okay. Same reason I say people like Corser and Gambert have to go, and I've had a couple of listeners say, do we have to hear much about this? And here's why we have to hear about it. Because Republicans and conservatives are held to a higher standard, which is why Todd Corser and Cindy Gambert should already be gone, which is why Kevin Cotter should drop the hammer and be done with it. It's a distraction that is used to a different level by the left, by the media, by all, uh, when it's a Republican involved in a scandal compared to a Democrat or a liberal. It's it's the way it is. Listen, I worked at NBC News for 14 years. Trust me, I know how the sausage is made, and you don't want to. Speaking of common sense, I, I want to get this in because I think this is interesting. Colin Noir has become one of the leading voices uh, for young gun enthusiasts here in, in this nation. And the reason I bring him up is because of all the conversations about gun control following what happened in Virginia, Walmart dropping the sale of AR-15s, and so much more. I thought this is a pretty interesting, blunt, and to the point rant by Colin Noir. Go with it. On August 26, 2015, in typical fashion, I woke up, picked up my cell phone so I could scroll through my Instagram feed to check the comment creeping section on Baller Alert. But instead, I saw an email with the video of two people being shot to death in real time. I don't care who you are. Watching two people being killed on national television will affect you emotionally. However, turning this murder into a gun control dog and pony show minutes after the shooting because you can't make sense of what just happened is ridiculous. Look, I get it. When stuff like this happens, anyone with a heart is going to want to feel the need to do something about it. The problem is there's an incredible disconnect regarding the topic of guns in this country. Gun control advocates keep saying common sense this, common sense solution that, this common sense legislation here. There are some common sense things that only Congress can do that we know would have a tangible impact in reducing gun violence in this country. So I'm trying to bring common sense ideas. Uh, as I say, I'm a gun owner, I'm a hunter, I go through background checks. To echo Andy Parker, whatever it takes to get common sense gun legislation passed in America. Let's be clear about something. There's nothing common sense about something as complex as violence and mental health. There's a cornucopia of existing gun laws already, and we've exhausted all of the common sense ones. Now we're at the hard part, and that doesn't mean passing arbitrary feel-good laws that will do more to hurt good people than they will the bad. We all have the same goal of keeping people safe. That's why we have guns, so that we can protect ourselves from the people we don't want having guns in the first place, but do. Unfortunately, reality dictates we don't know who those people are until they're beating, stabbing, or shooting at us. A psychopath lowlife who couldn't deal with the fact that no one liked him, which probably included his mother, records a video of himself killing two innocent people in cold blood, and then uploads it online like a low-budget reporter that he was, and then sends out some 
manifesto complaining about being the last of the black gay Mohicans. And in response to this atrocity in her typical robotic fashion, Hillary, where are the emails Clinton, starts talking gun control before they can cover the bodies of the deceased. Hey, and there is so much evidence that if guns were not so readily available, if we had universal background checks, if we could just put some time out between the person who's upset because he got fired or the domestic abuse or whatever other motivation. And here, folks, is why Hillary, I serve the base Clinton, President Obama, and the rest of the gun control Wu-Tang Clan are so full of it. They try to take advantage of people's ignorance about guns and their emotional response to horrible events to win votes and push an agenda that fosters an unhealthy dependence on the government, which does nothing but put more power into the hands of the people who only care about you during election season. And that's a fact. Colin Noir. Common sense. There's common sense for you. See, if you're for gun control, then you're not against guns because the guns will be needed to disarm you and your neighbors. So it's not that you're anti-gun. You'll need the police's guns and the military guns to take away other people's guns by force, obviously. So you're very pro-gun. You just believe that the government, you know, the reliable, trustworthy, fuzzy, warm government is the only entity that should be allowed to have guns. See, there is no such thing as gun control, just centralizing gun ownership. I'll be right back on a Tuesday on the Steve Gerber Show. Genuine Michigan common sense on display every day. All right, here it is. And this will play well into our next guest. Uh, but, but I had a caller call during the break and say, now, now why does... Um, Steve seemed to speak highly of John Kasich, support John Kasich. You know, when John Kasich seems to be very moderate and, and Steve seems to be more of a conservative. Well, let me answer the question for you. First and foremost, I'd like to see a Republican in the White House. I'd like to win. Because what difference does it make if you have all the conservative laurels and you're sitting home at your private residence and not sitting at the People's House, better known as the White House at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? Wouldn't your primary goal is to get somebody from your team through the door? And while I'm at it, though, let's let's talk about John Kasich briefly. Kasich served on both the Armed Services Committee and the Budget Committee. He is fiscally conservative. He is very strong pro-defense. He's pro-American, and he seems to be a dedicated Christian, from what I understand. So where exactly is he not conservative enough? Because he put Obamacare and allowed that to come into Ohio? Did you hear his comments on it? Because it was the law of the land and he felt it was the best thing he could do for his state. So looking out for his constituents isn't conservative enough? Or how about on gay marriage? When asked about during the debate. And he said, listen, if one of my daughters came home and told me she was gay, I would still love her just the same. Because that's what my Christian values teach me to do. And I hope that answers the question. First, uh, winning is important. And secondly, John Kasich is quite conservative on some very important points. Our next guest is Hadley Heath Manning, the Director of Health Policy at the Independent Women's Forum. And so we can talk about Kasich's plans and and track record with her because we're going to rate the Republican presidential hopefuls and their health care plans. Hadley, welcome back to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. So, all right, now, some of the heat, uh, and, and some of the listeners giving me heat for saying that John Kasich and, on the top and Marco Rubio on the bottom is a pretty solid ticket for the Republicans, in my estimation, in November of 2016. Whether or not it comes to pass, we'll see. But let's start with Kasich's record. He's taken a lot of heat from fellow Republicans for what he did with Obamacare in Ohio. Right, well, I'm a conservative health policy analyst, so, of course, I'm going to be critical of his decision to expand Medicaid in Ohio He's one of the rare Republican governors who didn't hold the line on that very important question. And so I think that was a mistake. I think that will hurt him with Republican voters. Um, but ultimately, we do have a broad field, and I appreciate your comments. But hold on. About, hold on, Hadley. Hold you know, on. Stop have, right there. Hold on. Win. <laughs> you got to win, number one. And let me ask you something. Did his decision hurt the people of Ohio? I mean, he's been able to reduce deficits, t- took a deficit and turned it into a surplus. Uh, of, of two, you know, millions of dollars now in millions of dollars in a surplus, uh, or billions, excuse me. So, 
his decision to go through with the Obamacare thing, saying it was the law of the land, and apparently he's been proven to be right by at least two Supreme Court decisions so far. Seems to me he was um, made a pretty decent decision. Well, importantly, what the Supreme Court said and their first decision about Obamacare in 2012 was that the Medicaid expansion would be optional for states. And so this was really an important decision that gave states the opportunity to choose. And to answer your question, are the people of Ohio better off? I mean, I think any time you're expanding the number of people who are dependent on government, that may feel like a good thing for them in the near term because they have a new benefit. But Dependency isn't good for our culture in the long run. So I think ultimately the question of is, is expanding government into people's lives a good thing, I think that's an easy answer for a conservative. Of course not. Well, okay then. Is government health care going to be here in 10 years, 20 years? I think, I think so. You know, you look at years? what the Affordable Care Act has done, and you look back to 1965 when we created these programs, Medicare, Medicaid, They've been around for a long time, and the American people and our culture has just kind of come to expect that the federal government will play some role in the arena of health care. Now, what that role is and whether or not conservatives can be successful at limiting the federal government's role is a different question. But, yes, I think well, the Hadley, federal the government point. is going to continue to play some role in our health care system. Of course they are, because the Republican mantra is repeal and replace. It's not repeal and forget about it. So the whole notion that, you know, you're too dependent on government and conservatives don't like that, no, we don't. But we have to live with it. And we have to have somebody that can win. That's my point. Uh, Health care through the government is here to stay. It's not leaving. It's repeal and replace, not repeal and, you know, and bury it and everybody's on their own. So, I, again, I think that Kasich's approach was reasonably pragmatic, and and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with my position. Anyhow, let's talk about some of the other candidates then and how you think they stack up. Okay, and I think conservatives should remember, too, that the world before Obamacare, you know, the world just five years ago, was not a world where the government was not involved in health care. The government Bingo. has been overly involved in health care for too long, and so I hope that these plans um, that we're going to discuss will be, you know, the, the reason we need to replace Obamacare with conservative health care reforms is not to uh, expand the federal government's role into health care, reshape the federal government's role in health care, but to limit it and to restrict it. So there, there is a direction that we can go as conservatives that would be beneficial, um, not just in terms of how the health care system works, but constitutionally speaking, to recognize that the federal government doesn't have any constitutional role in health care, but um, because of our culture and because of previous laws, um, people have come to expect it. So we can talk just briefly. There are three Republicans who I've, I've written about recently. They have comprehensive health care plans that they've written about, that they're on the record about. Governor Jindal released his plan over a year ago. He has a think tank where, where he's the chairman, and they've put together several uh, detailed policy plans. Um, Governor Walker of Wisconsin has a health care plan, and Senator Marco Rubio has a health care plan. And these health care plans have, have some things in common and I think reflect some conservative health care proposals that have been around for decades. We haven't been able to see success in this arena, I think, in part because we haven't had um, the control of the legislature and the White House that we've needed to do that. Um, but they're plans that would ultimately address some of the disadvantages in our tax code for people who buy health insurance outside of an employer-sponsored plan, which I think is a big part of why our third-party payment system is so bloated and inefficient. Uh, and they would also return a lot of the health care decisions to the state level, so ultimately bowing out as the federal government and, and giving that autonomy back to the state where it belongs. Um, and so I, I think these plans are ultimately we need to talk about them um, for two reasons. Number one, because they're good policy, and number two, because they're good politics. Republicans have been blamed for not having any positive ideas about how to um, make the health care system better and more competitive and more free market. But these plans would do exactly that. So I think they're beneficial to us for, for a lot of reasons. We're on the line with Hadley Heath Manning, the Director of Health Policy at the Independent Women's Forum. Uh, and, and you were right about, you know, government has no constitutional role in health care or in marriage or in regulating the mud puddles in my driveway. But the government has wandered into all sorts of places they don't really belong. And, and unfortunately, because of Supreme Court decisions and precedent, we have to deal with uh, some of it along the way, Hadley. Um, I'll give you 30 seconds for the last word on, on what you think uh, the 2016 presidential election will mean for health care politics. Well, I certainly hope to see the issue front and center because it's something where many Americans, you know, despite 
or maybe because of five years of Obamacare, continue to be very dissatisfied with the high costs and the limited choices. So Republicans would do well to talk about expanding those choices and limiting those costs, because ultimately this is a pocketbook issue, and it's an issue where Americans fear uh, that we've gotten on the wrong path and we can't get off of it. So that offering that hope that we can change course will be very important. Hadley Heath Manning, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. There you have it. It's the Steve Gerber Show on a Tuesday. We'll be right back. Taking a closer look at the stories that affect you most with a big dose of common sense. 73 men sailed up from the San Francisco Bay. Rolled off of their ship and here's what they had to say. We're calling everyone. All right, welcome back to it. The ever more absurd and sordid tale of Todd Corser and Cindy Gamert rolls on. According to a summary report, they betrayed taxpayers and their constituents. Betrayed. Um, uh, they're, uh, they're in a collision course with history, and no question about that. Joining me now, Bill Ballinger from Inside Michigan Politics. Bill, welcome back to the program. Good morning, Steve. Uh, well, we're headed someplace we haven't been in a very long time, and a place we've never been very often as a state, and that is uh, uh, throwing people flat out. Uh, Todd Corser and Cindy Gamrat are on on the way to getting the boot, are they not? I think so, no question. Uh, either resignation or expulsion. Yeah, I don't think they're going to. Re- I don't think Todd Corser is going to resign. Uh, Cindy Gamrat uh, has held a lower profile in this whole thing. I think if, if she could. Uh, what does your gut tell you? You've watched this thing for you know for decades. What does your gut tell you about this whole thing? Well, you say it's been a very long time since something like this happened, but actually it hasn't been all that long. Uh, Back in 2000, 2001, David Jay, a state senator, uh, was expelled by the state senate after he refused to resign. And, Steve, he wasn't even charged with anything (laughs) legally at the time of his expulsion. He had been, but the charges were dropped. Um, And back in 1978, the Democrats who were in the majority in the State House did expel one of their own members, an attorney named Monty Geralds, after he refused to resign. And that really is the issue. Uh, There have been numerous instances over the last 30 or 40 years where legislators have gotten themselves in really hot water and done something bad and pressure mounted continuously on them to resign and they always said we will not resign much like you were hearing pretty much from Todd Corser and Cindy Gamera right now but ultimately they all did resign except in those two cases that I just cited well, you know, and, and and I guess you know I, the David J thing is fairly recent in memory. The one back in 1978, I I don't recall that one. But it, it, as you look at those, it's still fairly fairly rare what we're going through here. No question about it. And uh, I think that it's a big distraction when we've got big issues in front of the legislature, like fixing the roads, for example, and we've got this whole hullabaloo going on to the side that's pulling the attention away from where it really need to be. Yeah, absolutely. You're no. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a distraction. Uh, it's a sideshow, and the legislature has a major challenge in this road situation that's been going on now for almost four years, uh, and they haven't resolved it. And the public is increasingly impatient and outraged that they haven't. And yet, what is the public uh, getting from the legislature? They're getting the Gamrat Corser fiasco. I think fiasco is a good way to put it. Now, yeah, and, and then you know another um, long rambling uh, publication by Todd Corse yesterday, four thousand plus words, basically questioning the investigation. I, I, how long do we have to put up with this? Well, we're going to have to put up with it until he either resigns or is expelled. And it's just it going to go on and on like this. Uh, it, it's a free country. He's got. First Amendment rights, and he can say and write anything he wants to. He may make a fool of himself, and he may outrage the public, but, you know, he can't be stopped from really talking. 
Um, all he's doing, you're right, is probably uh, hastening his own demise one way or the other, but that doesn't prevent him from uh, babbling on. Uh, this has happened in the past. I think Corser is probably a far greater offender than any of the people who have been in trouble over 30 or 40 years when they've gotten themselves in this situation. I haven't ever seen any of them... Uh, you know, hold forth with these incredible defenses as much as Todd Corser has. Cindy Gamrat has been very circumspect and very quiet. I don't think it's probably going to save her, but at least she's taken the opposite approach from Todd Corser, much to the relief of the legislature and the general public. Yeah, I suppose. It. But what can Kevin Cotter do? Uh, to move this process forward, is there anything that the, that the lawmakers can do to expedite this this process, or is it slow process and that's just the way it is? Well, he's appointed a committee of six members, four Republicans and two Democrats. He's named who they are. Uh, the committee is going to be chaired uh, by Ed McBroom, who is a state representative from the Upper Peninsula. And they're just going to methodically proceed forward. This is the way the Senate handled the David J. situation 15 years ago. And it is going to take some time. If Corser and Gamrat don't take everybody off the hook by resigning, it's probably going to drag out for another couple of months. Uh, but I think increasingly the public won't care so much if the legislature could finally do something dramatic on roads or a couple of other issues where the public would like to see the legislature taking positive action. Uh, you're probably right about that. They can make some progress somewhere. Uh, I guess we'll keep an eye on that. But uh, uh, for now, uh, it's just the uh, daily little bits that keep uh, bleeding out, I suppose, and hopefully it'll go away soon because we need to focus back on other things. Bill, always a pleasure, my friend. My pleasure, Steve. There you have it. Bill Ballinger, everybody, from Inside Michigan Politics. And, and as much as we'd like to put this behind us, uh, there's a procedure. And the procedure takes time. And unfortunately, it takes too much time, in my estimation, when there are so many other things uh, more important, like the roads, like where we're going with schools and taxes and budgets and a, and a hundred other things I could name. And yet we're... we're focusing on this circus to the side again when you have lost the trust of well pretty much everyone it's time to go it's tuesday on the steve gerber show